a new day has come. For some 200 years, Christians experienced official and unofficial persecution. It was not until the conversion of the Emperor Constantine that Christianity gained official acceptance and support. Constantine had dropped the sword of persecution in order to take up the cross. With Constantine, Christianity shifted from being an illicit, persecuted sect to being a welcome religion, and soon the dominant religion of the Roman Empire. The theologian John Neendorf wrote about Constantine, no single human being in history has contributed to the conversion of so many to the Christian faith. Who was this man? What did Constantine do for Christianity? What is his historical significance? What legacy did he leave? Come with me on a journey, the quest for answers, looking for the first followers of Jesus in Turkey. Constantine the first was known as Constantine the Great, equal to the apostles, first Christian emperor of Rome, builder of Constantinople, and the founder of the Byzantine Empire. Many saw him as a military victor, an effective ruler, and a glorified saint. The Greek historian of Christianity, Eusebius of Caesarea, describes him as such an emperor as all history records not. John Norwich, the English historian, reiterates this opinion on a global scale, stating that no ruler in all of history has ever more fully merited his title as the Great. Constantine has serious claims to be considered the most influential man in all of history. Constantine's most significant acts and important initiatives in church history included the legal initiation of freedom for Christianity with the Edict of Milan, the establishment of the First Ecumenical Council at Nicaea, and the relocation of the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople. Flavius Valerius Constantius, who would become Roman Emperor Constantine I, was born on February 27, around 280 AD, in Naissus Moesia, now known as Serbia. His father, Flavius Valerius Constantius, also known as Constantius Chloris, was an officer in the Roman army. Constantius' mother, Helena, was from humble beginnings. It is unknown whether she was the wife or concubine of Constantius. In 289 AD, Flavius left Helena to marry Theodora, stepdaughter of Maximian, who had been recently appointed co-emperor by Roman Emperor Diocletian. In March 293 AD, Diocletian established a system of tetrarchy by appointing two Caesars, and Flavius was appointed as Maximian Caesar. At this time, Constantine was sent to the court of Diocletian, where he received formal education, learning Latin literature, Greek, and philosophy. He witnessed Diocletian's great persecution, the most severe persecution of Christians in Roman history. In 305 AD, the two emperors, Diocletian and Maximian, abdicated to be succeeded by their respective deputy emperors, Galerius Valerius Maximinus and Flavius Valerius Constantius, Constantine's father. Constantine then joined his father on a military campaign and fought alongside him in Britain. After the death of his father on July 25, 306 at Iboricum, Constantine was declared Augustus by his troops, though Galerius, who was Augustus at the time, granted him the title of Caesar. Constantine's share of the Roman Empire consisted of Britain, Gaul, and Spain. 
In 308 AD, Licinius, a close friend of Galerius, was also appointed Augustus. When Galerius died in 311 AD, Constantine, Licinius, and Maximian's son, Maxentius, were the major powers in Rome. Maxentius declared himself emperor. He lived in Rome and took control of Rome and Italy. Constantine and his army marched against Maxentius. On October 28, 312 AD, the forces of Maxentius met Constantine's forces on the river of Tiber. Constantine's army was outnumbered two to one, but legend states that in the night, he had a significant dream where he had a vision of Jesus and was told that he would conquer with the sign of the Christian cross. Constantine had his soldiers paint the cross on their shields and he made a promise that if he was successful in the battle, he would adopt Christianity. Eusebius of Caesarea, who was Constantine's friend, describes this moment. He saw with his own eyes in the heavens a trophy of the cross arising from the light of the sun, carrying with the message, with this sign you will conquer. In the battle the following morning, Constantine was decisively successful and he was able to enter Rome the next day. The Senate hailed the victor as savior of the Roman people. Constantine now became the Western Roman Emperor. Constantine who had been a pagan sun worshiper, now looked upon the Christian deity as having brought victory. The persecution of the Christians ended, and Constantine's co-emperor Licinius joined him in issuing the Edict of Milan, which mandated toleration of Christians in the Roman Empire. As guardian of Constantine's favorite religion, the church was then given legal rights and large financial donations. The relationship between Constantine and Licinius began to deteriorate after an assassination attempt on Constantine by a man Licinius wanted to be Caesar. Also, Licinius wanted to recommence the oppression of Christians. This led to the Great Civil War of 324. Constantine won a series of victories and finally forced Licinius to surrender after defeating him at the Battle of Chrysopolis. Though Constantine initially spared his life, Licinius was later executed on suspicion of treasonable actions. By defeating Licinius, Constantine became the sole emperor of the Roman Empire. Constantine's victory over Licinius marked the rise of Christian and Latin-speaking Rome and the decline of the pagan and Greek-speaking population. Constantine decided to give the East its own capital. The Greek city of Byzantium was chosen and re-inaugurated in 324 AD. It was dedicated on the 11th of May 330 and renamed Constantinople or Constantine City. Constantine considered it his capital and made it his permanent residence. The city became the largest and wealthiest European city and was instrumental in the advancement of Christianity. Today, Constantinople lies here in Turkey is known as Istanbul and is one of the most populous European cities. Constantine continued to proclaim his adherence to Christianity and his reign established influence over the church. The once despised religion was on its way to becoming the state religion, the spiritual cement of a single society in which public and private life were united under the control of Christian doctrine. If Christianity were to serve as the cement of the empire, he had to hold one faith. Constantine intervened in ecclesiastical affairs to achieve unity. He presided over the first ecumenical council of the church at Nicaea in 325 AD. Out of this council came the Nicene Creed, which is a statement of the Orthodox faith of the early Christian church in opposition to certain heresies, especially Arianism. The Nicene Creed defended the doctrine of the, tr the Trinity and the deity of Christ. 
for reasons shrouded in darkness and uncertainty. In 326, Constantine had his oldest son Crispus and his wife Fausta executed. He later was apparently plagued with guilt. His mother Helena convinced him of his error and sin. It seems that this sense of guilt and need for repentance is what caused Constantine to send Helena on her mission to the Holy Land. In about 326 or 327, Helena traveled to Palestine. She sought out the original locations associated with the life of Jesus, and she oversaw the construction of churches Constantine had ordered to be built at such sites, Bethlehem, Calvary, the Mount of Olives, and Bethany. A pagan temple to Aphrodite had been built on the tomb site of Jesus' resurrection. It was torn down and replaced by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Constantine had hoped to be baptized in the Jordan River, but perhaps because of the lack of opportunity, he delayed the ceremony until the end of his life. Constantine received baptism, putting off his imperial purple robe for the white robe of a neophyte. He died on May 22, 337 in Ankara, near Nicomedia, Bithynia, modern-day Izmit, Turkey, at the approximate age of 57. He was buried at Constantinople in his Church of the Apostles. Constantine has earned a place in history for many reasons, not the least because he brought the persecution of Christians by the pagan Roman Empire to an end. A major turning point in Western history occurred when the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity in 312 AD. Historians now debate whether the first Christian Emperor was a Christian at all. Some think an unprincipled power seeker. What religion he had, many argue, was at best a blend of paganism and Christianity for purely political purposes. Certainly, Constantine held to ideals we no longer share. He knew nothing of religion without politics or politics without religion. But the result was the end of persecution of Christians and the beginning of Christendom with the unification of church and state. The effect of the changes Constantine implemented was twofold. Church leaders now had access to the machinery of the state to exercise ecclesiastical control. But even more importantly, Constantine himself could establish priorities of bishoprics to suit his goals. By his patronage, Constantine aligned the former Church of the Martyrs persecuted, powerless, and pacifist, with the military might and earthly glory of the state. Christianity would never be the same again. Soon the wars of the empire became holy wars. Church leaders looked for civil sanctions to back up their ecclesiastical judgments. The Council of Nicaea deposed Arius. Constantine exiled him. Rulers began to convene synods of church leaders and to influence or intimidate their proceedings. The church hierarchies learned how to invoke state coercion against heretics and schismatics, and they came to control increasing property and wealth. As a result, persecution commenced. Persecution of Christians by Christians, persecution of pagans by Christians, and persecution of Jews and Muslims by Christians. What is clear is that several significant shifts took place after Constantine's deal with the church. The implications of these shifts were disastrous for the Jesus movement, which was transforming the Roman world from the bottom up. Rodney Stark, widely considered to be the foremost expert on the church in this period, summed it up in these dramatic terms. For far too long, Christians have accepted the claim that the conversion of the Emperor Constantine caused the triumph of Christianity. 
To the contrary, he destroyed its most attractive and dynamic aspects, turning a high-intensity grassroots movement into an arrogant institution controlled by an elite group who often managed to be both brutal and lax. What shifts will lead Starr to make such an intense statement? Stuart Murray, in his book, Paul's Christendom, Church and Mission in a Strange New World, outlines the major shifts that took place in the Christian movement after Constantine's deal with the Church. The main shifts are... The adoption of Christianity as the official religion of a city, state, or empire. The movement of the Church from the margins of society to its center. The creation and progressive development of a Christian culture or civilization. The assumption that all citizens, except for the Jews, were Christian by birth. The development of Corpus Christianum, where there was no freedom of religion and where political power was regarded as divinely authenticated. Infant baptism as a symbol of obligatory incorporation into this Christian society. Sunday as an official day of rest an obligatory church attendance with penalties for non-compliance. The definition of orthodoxy as the common belief shared by all, which was determined by powerful church leaders supported by the state. The imposition of a supposedly Christian morality on the entire society, although normally Old Testament moral standards were applied. A hierarchical ecclesiastical system based on a diocesan and parish arrangement which was analogous to the state hierarchy and was buttressed by state support. The construction of massive and ornate church buildings and the formation of huge congregations. A generic distinction between clergy and laity and the relegation of the laity to a large passive role. The increased wealth of the church and the imposition of obligatory tithes to fund this system. The defense of Christianity by legal sanctions to restrain heresy, immorality, and schism. The division of the globe into Christendom and Hiddendom, and the waging of war in the name of Christ and the church. The use of political and military force to impose the Christian faith. The use of the Old Testament, rather than the New, to support and justify many of these changes. These 17 shifts presented by Murray give us a brief idea about what happened with the original movement of Jesus Christ and the Apostles after the state and church came together under Constantine's leadership. What were some of the implications of these shifts? Let's focus on five of them to ponder a little further. Firstly, let's consider the assumption that all citizens, except for the Jews, were Christians by birth. Since Christianity was adopted as the official religion of a city, state, or empire, everyone now is considered Christian or must become Christian. There are at least two main implications. First, it created a type of second-level Christian, a nominal Christian where it does not matter if you have accepted Jesus of Nazareth as your Savior and Lord, you are considered Christian. One became a Christian as part of the social heritage rather than by a considerate choice of faith. Now, faith in Christ was no longer understood as the exercise of choice in a pluralistic environment where other choices were possible without penalty. The term conversion came to mean not the start of the Christian life, but rather the entrance into a monastic community. Discipleship was interpreted as loyal citizenship rather than commitment to the countercultural values of God's kingdom. This new paradigm goes totally against what Jesus had instructed about freedom, decision, and commitment. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Another implication of the assumption that all citizens were Christians by birth is related to the mission of the church. If everyone is already a Christian, why should the mission of sharing the good news of Christ be part of what we do? Everyone is Christian already. The church's orientation was now moving towards maintenance rather than mission and mission was carried out by specialist agencies, not congregations. 
Mission within and beyond Christendom was accomplished by top-down methods, including coercion and the offer of inducements. This implication negatively impacts the last words of Christ, which are registered in the book of Matthew. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The second shift that we want to discuss succinctly is this one uh, about infant baptism as a symbol of obligatory incorporation into the Christian society. The New Testament presents baptism as an initiation ceremony whereby those who express faith in Christ are incorporated into the church. The symbolism of being washed clean and dying to the past is a powerful incentive to live a life of wholehearted discipleship. The New Testament teaches that those who believed would be baptized, and the New Testament locates baptism close to the commitment to follow Jesus. During the next 250 years, the baptism of believers remained the normal practice. But as the church encountered people who understood little of God, Jesus' life and teaching and expectations of discipleship, an induction process was introduced to prepare them for baptism. This shift of baptizing babies involves many theological problems and at the same time eliminates the concepts of learning the foundations of the faith, ignoring the moral imperatives of discipleship, and the need for a formal, intentional, and rational decision for Christ. This also removed baptism from the start of the Christian life, linking it instead to the beginning of physical life. It meant entrance not into the church as a distinct community within society, but into a sacral society in which the church was no longer a separate entity. The third shift that we want to highlight is Sunday as an official day of rest and obligatory church attendance with penalties for non-compliance. Constantine's affection for sun worship had earlier led him to endorse Sunday, the first day of the week, in a day dedicated to honoring the sun as a weekly day of rest in the Roman Empire. This created considerable hardship for those Jews and true Christians who continue to keep the biblical Sabbath on the seventh day of the week. This imposition goes directly against God's law that clearly states the observance of the seventh day of the week. The main point in question is about spiritual authority and submission. Who is the ruler and leader of for spiritual matters in our lives? Men or God? Traditions or Bible? Jesus' disciples made their decision. Peter and the other apostles answer and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The fourth shift we want to discuss today is the construction of massive and ornate church buildings and the formation of huge congregations. Worship was vastly changed. It moved from homes, where it was largely held in the first three centuries, to special buildings designed for church services. The new churches built from the fourth century onward were copied from Roman buildings for civilian government. The churches were to be where the entire population could have religion, rather than a company of believers gathering in the informality and fellowship of a Christian household. Soon the new churches were made ornate a place where wealthy and the powerful could feel comfortable. Trained musicians replaced congregational singing. Clergy entered in a processional dress and priestly clothing. This service became highly structured in liturgy and ritual. Gone was the simple service of a fisherman of Galilee. Rome had all but smoother the jubilant faith of the early Christians. Worship and spiritual life was a daily reality experienced in the usual deeds of the day. Now it was limited to a specific time and location inside four walls. This led to a dichotomy in life, with worldly aspects on one side and spiritual aspect on the other. The outcome of this division brought a poor understanding of spiritual life where it does not matter what I do or how I live outside of the church building. As long as I attend the church services and pay my duties, I'm okay with God. This goes against what Paul wrote, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. The 
fifth and last shift we'll consider today is a generic distinction between clergy and laity and the relegation of the laity to a largely passive role. After Constantine, the church began developing a clerical priesthood and a new sacrificial system that resembled that of the Old Covenant, the Aaronic priesthood. A synagogue model of worship was replaced by a temple model. Communion evolved over the centuries into the sacrifice of the mass with the clerical priesthood alone qualified to administer it. The gap between the clergy and laity widened. The gospel suffered because the concept of the priesthood of all believers was lost. The church began to teach that ordinary people could not come directly to God through Jesus Christ. They would now need a religious person of power, a priest to help them connect with God's salvation. Another point that we cannot forget is that this shift impacts the biblical concept of spiritual gifts, where God bestows upon all believers spiritual gifts with the aim of equipping the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, the believer cannot use his or her spiritual gifts since he or she is not a member of the clergy. The major shifts that took place with Constantine and followed by an age of Christian emperors led to what is known as the Dark Ages. This was a terrible period in human history where the Jesus movement, Christianity, was far off course from the original plan. The prophecies of the prophet Daniel were thus fulfilled. In Daniel 8, the prophet foretold a desolation by a power that would raise itself up against God and his plan for his children. This power cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. But God's light is able to breach any darkness, and glimpses of heaven's light were present during the Dark Ages. The light of God's truth broke out in a mighty way during the Reformation. At the end, God is always the conqueror, always the victor. Maybe you who are listening to me at this moment are living a season of Dark Ages in your life, far from God, far from His plans, far from His loving arms suffering loneliness and bitterness and the consequences of living without God. Friend, it doesn't matter how far you've gone. No matter how dark your days seem, you are not out of reach of God's love. His mercy is always right where you are, no farther away than a thought. He will move, He will prove Himself faithful to you, and He will arm you with victory in the end. Come to Him. He is waiting for you. He will never deny you. You can come to Him today. Choose to trust Him now, my friend. Trust Him now. Once again I find myself Trying to confess my sins You know who truly am and see what others don't you know all that's in my heart my struggles and my past I wish to do what's right and good, but I'm chained to who I am. Once again, I'm here, my Lord, I surrender to you. Take me as I am Be crazy.
crucified with Christ so he may live in me. No matter what I try to do and feelings fall short when compared to you I don't have what it takes but only through you Christ my sacrifice and the saving blood you spill I will have new life and hope once again I'm here my Lord I surrender to to be one with you my life to mirror yours to be crucified with Christ so he may live in me to be crucified with Christ so he may live in me our Father and our God we thank you for the light of your truth we thank you for the way that you've led your church through challenges at times we pray that you would help us as believers in these last days to follow every word that proceeds from your mouth. Lord Jesus, give us eyes to see and ears to hear the messages that you have for us today. And may our lives bring you glory. May they bring you pleasure. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friend, thank you so much for watching us today. Don't forget to share with your friends and relatives the quest for answers, looking for the first followers of Christ here in Turkey. Please visit our website. On our website, you can leave us a message, your prayer request, and order a copy of today's show or the completely series. If you feel moved to support our ministry, you can make your donation on our website as well. I hope to see you again soon.